The great part about being nominated for short nonfiction is that I can essentially read you the entire article with just most of its innards pulled out. Uh, so this is the condensed version of Film's First Lycanthrope, 1913's The Werewolf. There's a saying that history is written by the survivors. Whoever is still around to tell the story gets to tell their own version, while the perspectives of the dead molder along with them in their graves. Film history, then, is told by surviving film. With the majority of silent films lost forever, huge swaths of our film history have disappeared. Lost horror films are often skipped over in books as if they never existed at all. Thus, when writers talk about early werewolf performances, they tend to start with Henry Hall and Lon Chaney Jr., rather than Phyllis Gordon. The loss of 101 Bison's 1913 film, The Werewolf, means few people remember that film's first wolf man was actually a wolf woman. Gordon's title character is, in fact, a Native American woman who shapeshifts into a wolf to fight off invading white settlers and to exact revenge for a hundred-year-old grudge. In an era when supernatural content was usually more fantastic than frightening, the werewolf is more direct and more decidedly horrific than even some of its successors. The film contains supernatural elements beyond mere lycanthropy, such as witchcraft and reincarnation, and its source material contains elements so gruesome that it's shocking that anyone in 1913 was inspired to turn it into a film at all. Written by Honoré Beaugrand, the story begins with an old trapper telling some soldiers he saw a band of Iroquois who were half-human and half-beasts, cutting a human corpse into pieces to eat. He and his companions, fearing being next, carved crosses in their bullets and supplemented their ammo with rosary beads. A sergeant tops the story with one of his own, about a soldier named Baptiste, who married an Indian maiden in a native ceremony, but abandoned her when his regiment was relocated. She curses his new wife, a white woman, to die of smallpox. Baptiste goes to confront her, but instead finds a vicious wolf, and in a fight for his life, he lops off its front paw. Later, children playing in the snow find a severed arm. The soldier recognizes it as belonging to his estranged native wife, who he knows now is surely a loop garou. The story ends with a sergeant telling what he last heard of Baptiste that he was captured and burned at the stake. First, though, he was tortured at length by one who seemed to take special pleasure in the task, cutting out his tongue and bashing in his skull with a tomahawk. The gleeful perpetrator of the torture was, according to the text, a one-armed squaw. To translate this fairly gory tale into a two-reeler for the screen, 101 Bison hired a woman, Ruth Ann Baldwin, who retained the idea of a scorned woman's revenge and wrote in additional layers of supernatural intrigue. Her script imagines a werewolf created by witchcraft and the return of the native woman via reincarnation 100 years later. It's notable for the fact that the wolf kills a white woman for revenge and it's not covered up with some kind of happy ending. It's a true werewolf story and a true revenge story with a fatal ending and the monster wins. The werewolf's success led Universal to pursue more weird content in subsequent Indian productions, such as 1914's Legend of the Phantom Tribe, featuring a shape-shifting bear, a magic stone, and the gruesome massacre of an entire tribe, after which a witch summons a cloud of wraiths from their corpses to exact revenge. In 1915's The Arrow Maiden, a medicine woman resurrects a dead brave to help her get revenge in sort of a Native American precursor to the zombie masters of the 1930s. Native American mythology gave filmmakers a safe way to explore mystical themes that would have seemed unsavory to audiences at the time if explored by white characters. In the early silent era, the sense of Native Americans as an exotic other was exploited for horror themes in the same way that black characters would later be used in voodoo films. It's an underexplored aspect of early horror that isn't helped by the fact that so many of these films are lost. And that's the tragedy of lost films. When a film is lost, we've lost more than just the film itself and the ability to watch and enjoy it. 
we've also lost its potential for influence on other films and on our culture. Lon Chaney's Wolfman is an iconic representation of the werewolf that has shaped a host of films that came after. But how would that image be different if we could still see Phyllis Gordon's wolf transformation? Would the iconic representation of werewolves be female? Would Native American myths be a bigger part of what we think of as the established werewolf rules? Even if the film were found today, it would be impossible to know what its potential impact might have been. As the last known reels of the werewolf were consumed in a 1924 fire at Universal, that speculation is all that we have. Hi everyone, I'm Karen Warren and I'm going to read you a short excerpt from my novella, Into Bones Like Oil. Uh, the official audiobook's coming out in the next couple of weeks, which is very exciting. So this is sixth day Sunday breakfast. Sleep was supposed to be restorative, but Dora woke feeling worse, exhausted, her throat sore as if she'd been talking all night. Her jaw ached from laughing the night before. She felt a deep sense of despair, as if in her dream she lived out a different life, one even darker and sadder. Luke had left a note under her door, so she went upstairs and knocked on his door. There was no answer. The burned woman's door was open. It was always open. Peering in, Dora saw her skirt was raised up again, exposing her bush, her scarred legs. She was in a deep sleep, lips murmuring. Dora heard... Is there parsley for the sauce? Cook sent me, cook did. Cook's long gone now, I know that. Here's me looking for parsley. I can't see what's next. I keep looking and looking, but there's nothing there. Dora laughed. Shh, she heard, and she spun to see Roy in the corner, crouched down with a microphone in his hands. He put his fingers to his lips, but he whispered, you can play with yourself if you like. Some people can't help it. And she was ashamed to realise that she did feel aroused. That was more thinking about Luke, though. Not this. Not this woman talking in the voice of someone long dead. Who are you? Dora asked her, but there was no answer. The woman stopped talking soon after and Roy nodded. He jerked his head to indicate they should leave. In the hallway, he said, you were a very good conduit last night. This could account for her sore throat, and she felt a blank space in her head as if she'd had a big night and was suffering an alcohol blackout. Certainly she'd had enough to drink to make that possible. Who was it? she asked. What did they say? A little girl. She mostly spoke about trying to find her mother, but there was mention of the captain too. I need the captain, Roy said. He's the last bit of the puzzle. I need him to fill in the blanks, finish the story. Your little girl said he had very pink skin, so how would she know that? That's what I want to know. She said he was pink like a little piggy. Dora smelled salt, felt a warmth pass her by. What happens to the ghosts once their secret is told? Can they leave? Roy said, except no one's story is ever finished. It changes, is added to. The more we know, the more it changes. That's why some of them keep coming back. Come on now breakfast. Thanks. Hi, it's Linda Addison. I'm one of the authors of The Place of Broken Things, a collaborative poetry collection that's on the final ballot for the Stoker, which is pretty exciting. Ah. Okay, I'd like to read um, from uh, a poem that was written by myself and Alessandro Manzetti. Um, it's called The Yellow House. The Dutch man is painting his house in chrome yellow, like the sun, like the golden teeth of an archangel. A bell rings in the distance. The holy scent of candied fruit is floating all around. No. She cannot find me here, thinks the man. So far from Paris and its demons, 
The Dutchman is painting himself on the walls of the yellow house. Sun petals bloom from his head. The light of Provence in a moment walks in the window, a glimpse on the canvas. Then through an empty glass, becoming a memory of the transparent bread of wine. Not a place of broken things, thinks the man, so far from Paris and its screens. Evening stars and revelations. What is the Dutchman afraid of? Eternity. He can feel it on his skin, sucking days like a cold leech. That limitless space, he can't paint it all. Too much shadow, too much to take. Someone knocks on the door, repeating the same words. Vincy. You again, thinks the man, crawling under the table. She's waiting outside pregnant. The Dutchman found a path to the next world in the walls of the yellow house, like the first memory of a dream, bright, still life captured by imperfect human hands. Fighting isolation weeks ago, he found her in a field, and now, Vincent, not you again, whispers the man, squeezing his eyes, closed hands over ears. Still, she waits, refusing to leave. The Dutchman found a road away from the roaring city, from the broken. Why are they afraid of him? Alchemy. He can feel it under his skin, humming in each breath like a newborn, suckling ideas from his noisy brain. She knocks again. Please, he prays, pressing his forehead against the rough wood floor. In his memory, her face is bright yellow. Daffodils cover every inch of her skin, obscuring the details of her face. Blue irises seep from her fingertips. The knocking stops. An echo of pleading rings in his ears. Was this a dream? Left by the moans of crowded buildings, of their need to change him, in his memory their faces are blurred gray. They, faces, would-be teachers, with hands frozen in muted palates. He calls from under the table. She was never there. His ears deceived him. The cracks in the walls begin to weep. I will give you color. I will give you stars and revelations. The Yellow House by Alessandro Manzetti and Linda Addison from the Place of Broken Things.